Howdy again there, YouTube. I'm Ben Fariolo, and I have returned once again. I still am around, guys. Don't worry. Before I start, please check the description box below for parts and links. Also, please go to my channel in the videos and watch part one and part two of Amateur Seismology Basics, Misconceptions, and Tools. Part one has a bunch of good info, and part two shows you how to download seismic data and review it in top-notch seismic software. I have still been conducting a huge amount of research into Yellowstone, seismology, and many other things. I have come to realize some is not as I thought it was. In this video, I will quickly be looking over this swarm here. It occurred at the northern tip of Yellowstone Lake at the end of December 2008, and it lasted for about a week or so, and was confirmed to be a type of intrusion by researchers including Jamie Farrell. If you don't know, Jamie Farrell is a seismologist from the University of Utah and the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory. Now, real quick, I want to say something. The phrase magma intrusion is losing its meaning, just like the phrase harmonic tremor, because people are throwing that word around when they see certain activity, without even double-checking or cross-correlating it with other types of data. This is why I no longer use YouTube for actual research, and I suggest you do the same. I'd rather just get my information on seismology from the online Wiley Library, the IRIS website, and among other research websites. I, you know, guys, I still use YouTube, of course, I watch people's videos to get info, but most of my research is done through actual research websites. Don't get me wrong, magma intrusion does occur here and there at Yellowstone, and definitely should be worrying and worth watching out for, even if there is no threat of an imminent eruption. That is due to the large threat that Yellowstone poses whenever it does decide to erupt next. And by the way, Long Valley Caldera is just as big of a threat, guys. It is, the uplift still is continuing. I, I'll be doing another video soon, uh, a little bit about that, so I'm not going to spill the beans too much. And for some of you out there who are monitoring Yellowstone, you probably already know some of this. I think Long Valley would probably erupt before Yellowstone next time. Alright, but there are people on the internet who use the phrase magma intrusion way too much. For example, they will point at the UNAVCO spectrographs, which show a 24-hour period within too small of a time frame, and see some blob or spike, and they immediately say that it is magma intrusion, even without cross-correlating it with other seismic data. Well, even if it were some type of injection, you have to compare that to seismic waveforms, uplift subsidence, and multiple other types of seismic data. I am telling you right now, vertical magma injection at Yellowstone, due to the pathway to the surface being almost certainly blocked, cannot, I repeat, cannot occur without an earthquake swarm. For a simple example, this is a figure from the publication I am about to show, talking about the 2008-2009 intrusion event. Notice the northward vertical migration of earthquakes from the magma chamber towards the surface. This is a perfect example of magma injection into the crust, and what happens to the rock surrounding the injection area. Now at the end of this publication they say it is likely magma intrusion or hydrothermal fluid intrusion is the cause of the event. Of course the hydrothermal fluid intrusion, if true, would be caused by a rise of magma, but the amount of earthquakes detected, total of 811 in one week, along with their waveform characteristics, which I will show as well, make it feel as if magmatic fluid migration is a way better explanation. Especially since one of the figures I am about to show shows an obvious fissural expansion mechanism upwards from the magma chamber and outwards when near the surface. At least that's my take on it. So whenever I hear someone say magma intrusion, I always look for an earthquake swarm or a spasmodic event. If there were only one or two earthquakes or so, I kind of forget about it. When magma intrudes into the upper portions of the crust, it will almost certainly be blocked. Even if it's not blocked and has a free pathway, it still will at least create a few microquakes here and there. Also, harmonic tremor is thought to be caused by magmatic resonance. Resonance means the vibration of the magma through a tube. Well, the resonance of the magma moving through that pathway, since it's almost not blocked, will almost certainly create harmonic tremor. At least that's one of the theories they put out there for the cause of harmonic tremor. But still, it is almost impossible for intrusion to occur without multiple earthquakes, guys. Just think of the raw power behind magma. So this process, since the magma is so powerful, will push gases and aqueous fluids, in other words water, with extreme pressure up to the surface causing tectonic earthquakes, low frequency earthquakes, rock break earthquakes, or a combination of all types. You simply cannot look at a spectrograph, especially one that only has a frequency range of 0 to 0 0.5 hertz, and say injection has occurred. 
Now, I'm not saying people are purposely lying. I'm just saying they are mistaken and not listening to the others around them. See, I don't know much, guys. I am trying to be humble because I still don't know anything. There's so much information to learn about seismology. That's why I'm going to go to school for it. But I do know for a fact that magma intrusion will show up as an earthquake swarm. Please go research other magma intrusion events throughout history. Also remember gases from the magma being injected and superheated water from the hydrothermal system may be released ahead of the injection front due to the fact that these can escape better than magma can under all that pressure. Yes, it is under a lot of pressure down there, guys. That is why the idea of magma injection occurring without an earthquake swarm at Yellowstone is far-fetched. Remember, I am only out for the truth, no matter where it leads me. I don't care if it leads me in one direction or the other. The truth is the truth, period. I take all sources seriously and check them out by researching on my own time. Now, injection has occurred before, possibly multiple times. An example of this is this swarm here, confirmed to be magma intrusion by top scientists. Though other intrusion events, scientists seem to have been silent about. God knows why. Now, how do I know that this event was confirmed to be magmatic intrusion? This publication, Dynamics and Rapid Migration of the Energetic 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake Earthquake Swarm, was posted to the online Wiley Library on October 13, 2010, and was written by Jamie Farrell, Robert B. Smith, Takayaki Tyra, please forgive me, guys, if I get your guys' names wrong, Wulung Chang, and Christine M. Puskas. Now, I will read the abstract real quick. Yellowstone National Park experienced an unusual earthquake swarm in December, January 2008-2009 that included rapid northward migration of the activity at one kilometer per day. That's, that's a good speed, guys. That's pretty fast. And shallowing of the maximum focal depths from 12 to 2 kilometers beneath northern Yellowstone Lake. The swarm consisted of 811 earthquakes... Even though they only reported 51 earthquakes to the public, God knows why, which ranged from magnitude 0.5 to 4.1, aligned on a north to south 12 kilometer long vertical plane of hypocenters. The largest earthquake of the swarm had a 50% tensile crack opening source, determined by a full waveform inversion that we interpret as a magmatic expansion component. In addition, GPS data revealed east to west crustal extension coincident with the swarm. Modeling of GPS and seismic data is consistent with an east to west opening of about 10 centimeters on a north to south striking vertical dike. Our interpretation is that the swarm was induced by magmatic fluid migration or propagation of a poroelastic stress pulse along a pre existing fracture zone. Now, guys, I'm not going to read much of this publication because I'd like you guys to, if you're interested, of course. The parts I read in this video are interesting, of course, but there are some pockets of goodies in this research paper for sure, guys. I'll read one last part real quick, which is this part right here, and it really got my attention. We prefer an interpretation of the 2008-2009 Yellowstone Lake Swarm as the result of an upper crustal dike intrusion of magma or magmatically derived aqueous fluids from the shallow Yellowstone Magma Reservoir. Although we cannot specify the type and depths of specific fluids, magma versus hydrothermal. Personally, guys, I believe it was magma itself due to the amount of earthquakes within such a short period of time and the characteristics of the seismic waveforms. If it were hydrothermal, of course, still caused by magma aggression, I theorize the swarm would not have been as large. And since this occurred somewhat near some geyser fields, then don't you think we would have seen a large output in hydrothermal eruptions, possibly even a few hydrothermal explosions since it got really close to the surface? But that is not what we see. And that is just a theory of mine, so let's continue reading. The fluid could have followed the pre-existing fracture zone that extends northward toward the largest part of the magma reservoir. Please see figure 3b. We also note, now listen to this part guys, that this unusual earthquake swarm may represent the first geophysical observation of a failed surficial hydrothermal volcanic event in Yellowstone. Woo-wee! Moreover, the observed temporal spatial seismic and deformation pattern reflects the style of volcano tectonic activity that can be expected in the Yellowstone volcanic field. And that could lead to triggering of larger earthquakes or volcanic eruptions in the future. Wow. Wow, guys. They actually admit this stuff. 
Now, how come they are not putting out publications about magma intrusion anymore? I believe the last publication they did was about the 2010 Madison Plateau Swarm. I think that was the last one they did. They haven't really updated us since 2010. So what about a publication into the massive summer 2017 swarm? Remember that, guys? Started about in the middle of June 2017, I think it was. It was large. That is something I'm wondering. Well, maybe they are, but I just haven't found it yet. But it is doubtful. This is a perfect example of a dike intrusion of magma. That could lead to an eruption. Thank God the swarm calmed. And there is, of course, no threat of any imminent eruptions right now within the Yellowstone Volcanic Complex. However, as proven by this publication, that could change at any minute. And definitely needs to be watched out for, especially when you see earthquakes occurring in this pattern. Notice how it moved northward, but was spreading out this way. You see that? That's a fissure. You can clearly see it looks like an underground fissure opening up. Earthquakes moving from deep to shallow in a random direction and spreading out from the main source. See, magma has to create an earthquake swarm if it is intruding into the rock. It is simple physics, guys. A material that is put under too much stress, in this case the stressor is magma, a powerful material, will fail and create earthquakes. Please go check out on Wikipedia or any encyclopedia the material failure theory. So this earthquake swarm here that lasted almost a week in December 2008 at Yellowstone Lake. Here, let me go to the calendar real quick, get a better overview. Yeah. Yeah, so this earthquake swarm here that lasted for almost a week in December 2008 at Yellowstone Lake is the first geophysical observation of a failed volcanic event at Yellowstone Caldera. Now, what do you think would have happened if the swarm continued and the magma was able to reach the surface? Well, right now, it is anyone's guess, really. But if magma reached the surface, we obviously would have seen a large hydrothermal explosion a few days prior to a surface breach, a large shallowing of the earthquake's depths, and of course, volcanic or harmonic tremor hours before the surface breach approaches. But what then? Well, all I'm saying right now is, of course, a theory. But it is good to ponder these things just in case this happens again, and I'm pretty sure it will happen again. So, what then? If the magma reaches the surface without creating a moderate ash eruption, it will most certainly create lava fountains. Yes, this is a possibility at Yellowstone, guys, though a pressurized ash eruption seems more likely due to pressure and the amount of quote-unquote blockage. Supposedly, 70,000 years ago, so they say, Yellowstone Lake was the epicenter of large lava fountains and eruptions, kind of like what we saw in Hawaii recently, but on a much, much larger scale. So once the magma has a free path to the surface, it is still constricted. As more and more magma attempts to flow to the surface, the initial pathway created by the intrusion simply will not hold all the magma that is trying to escape. So lava eruptions could persist for weeks, but since it would only release just about like 0.1% of the magma down there, based on eruption size, it will for sure attempt to breach the surface again or unzip the local faults, creating a large destabilized area. That could lead to a super eruption, releasing all of the pressure from the magma chamber, which could range anywhere from a VEI-6 eruption to a VEI-8 eruption. It all depends on the multitude of factors involved, some a little too complicated that even I don't understand right now. At least personally. Someday maybe I will, you never know. So thank god that this swarm stopped. But this is just the beginning. Since we have an idea of what confirmed magma intrusion looks like, we should keep an eye out for it, and use this event as a possible baseline of sorts. Since this was most likely a dike intrusion of magma, then what about the April 10th through 11th event and the July 5th event of this year, 2018? Well, it is my personal opinion those events were caused by very short-lived magma injection as well, though not as extreme as this event here in 2008-2009. So please go and read this article. I will leave a link to it in the description box below. It is very, very eye-opening. The 2010 Madison Plateau Swarm, in retrospect, which does not reside above the magma chamber, it resides kind of northwest of the magma chamber a few miles. It was said to be caused by magma pushing superheated water up into the fault zones diagonally as the magma attempted to ascend, though I personally believe the 2008-2009 swarm at Yellowstone Lake is the closest we have ever been to seeing any type of volcanic eruption at Yellowstone. Now before I move on to some seismic waveforms, I want to show you the three events I will be looking at. 
This is the first, the 2008-2009 swarm that contained over 800 earthquakes with only 51 being actually reported. But you could tell, look at the very uniform. You, you notice that? Almost, you could almost fit it into a perfect rectangle. Here is the second event I will quickly overview, the April 10th through 11th, 2018 likely intrusion event. Almost straight due south of the 2008-2009 dike intrusion at Yellowstone Lake. It's about, let's see, it was right here, so that's, yeah, that's about southwest. Increased deepening of the earthquake depths. Let's see, let's go down. If you'll notice, a lot of them were shallow. Notice some of them were a little more shallow. Three, two, four, seven, three. But down near the end of the swarm, you can see it starts to deepen right at the end. So this suggests that the magma, or whatever caused this swarm, met a large, stable area capable of pushing the magma back down. That is why the end of the sequence was a lot deeper than the majority of the other earthquakes in this swarm. At least that is my interpretation, and of course I could be completely opposite of the actual truth. And here's the third event I will overview, the July 5th event, which is most likely a case of short-lived magma injection, likely into a small local fault or crack. Magnitudes did not exceed 2.5. This one only lasted 40 minutes, but if it lasted longer, it would have been extremely concerning due to the rapid succession of the earthquakes in such a very, very short period of time. I believe this one event that lasted on July 5th, 2018 for only about 40 minutes is considered a spasmodic event. At least that is my take from it. I'm still learning about spasmodic events, so please cut me some slack, guys. <laughs> Now, a few of the earthquakes during the July 5th event were so closely spaced in time that it was virtually impossible to separate them. That's why a few of the events, I believe, were not reported. A theory as to what some volcanic tremor episodes are made of is possibly low-frequency earthquakes happening in such rapid succession that it is virtually impossible to separate visually. I'm not saying it is volcanic tremor that occurred, I'm just saying that it kind of looks similar. But to me, it looks more like a spasmodic event. The July 5th event is fascinating to me since it seems like there has never been an event like it at Yellowstone, ever, at least since the early 2000s when seismic instruments were updated. If there has, please let me know the date and time of the event so I could study it as well. So I'm continually studying this event and even creating a PowerPoint slideshow about it to use in conjunction with future earthquake swarms near Yellowstone Lake. The swarm lasted from about 5.45 UTC to about 6.25 UTC, July 5th, and some earthquakes were not reported, most likely due to the inability to separate the P and S wave arrivals, which, if you did not know, is how you locate the epicenter of any given earthquake. You take three seismographs, at the minimum, and draw a circle around each seismic station. The point where the circles intersect is where the earthquake occurred. Sounds easy? Haha, <laughs> nope. Ain't as easy as you think. There's a lot more to it than that. Depends on the coverage of a network, too. But inability to locate earthquakes should not inhibit geologists to reporting the event. I have an idea. USGS, if you're listening, this is actually, I think, is a good idea. So people can actually see all earthquakes that truly occurred, whether accurately located or not. How about the USGS earthquake site puts a little red question mark icon where the latitude and longitude info is given if the location is a simple estimate? Because truly, the public would rather know about the amount of earthquakes rather than their specific location down to the mile, right? But look at what is so interesting. Notice the first three earthquakes right down here. Here's the start, the first earthquake in the sequence. Start at 545, but they're saying there's one at 513. I'm going to look at the first three right here real quick. The first two were 11.1 .1 kilometers in depth, and the third was 10.2 kilometers in depth. So these three occurred a few hours before the possible intrusion began. Notice, now keep an eye right in this area right here. Let me go one, two, three. Let's do that again. Look right here. One, two, three. Notice how it went from deep to shallow from this area towards the north. Now where is this direction pointing? Right straight at the area where the event took place. I interpret this as the initial injection of magma into probably a small crack, or something not very large, and then it traveled north towards, or northwest towards this area here. The first earthquake in the actual swarm was reported to be 3.9 kilometers in depth, or almost 2 miles. Most of the events in this swarm were very shallow, about 1 to 2 miles under the surface, with one occurring so shallow, it was reported to be a negative depth. 
As stated in previous videos, a negative depth does not mean above the surface because earthquakes cannot happen in the air. But, and I mean a big but, this event here could be a large stress fissure opening to accommodate the additional stress that was not there before. So it does appear something was moving towards the swarm area prior to the swarm occurring. Notice that? One, two, three. The biggest one right here started. That It makes sense that the biggest one would be right here, you right? If the magma all of a sudden, boop, starts to move, it would create a big crack and start to move towards the surface here and here. And then here. I don't know. That is just my interpretation. So if anyone was within this area here, here's Little West Thumb right here. Um, so here's the earthquake. Negative 2.6 kilometers in depth. Must have been just right at the surface. It must have been maybe a fissure or a crack opening up. So if anybody was here around this area in the start of July, please let me know if you saw any new cracks or fissures or smelled anything like rotten eggs. So, let's see, which lake is this? Let's go to terrain. Shoshone Lake. If anybody was near Shoshone Lake during this time period, near July 1st to July 6th, please let me know. And it was right off Highway 20. Here we are at Swarm. You, let's see, which one? Let's see, December 2008, 2009. Let's do LKWY, the first one. And open file, LKWI, the second one. Now, some of the data is missing for the July, not the July, for the December, January 2008, 2009 earthquake swarm. Some of the data was missing, almost a whole day's worth, but chopped up at different times. Now, I don't know why. I'm not saying they did it on purpose, because I don't know why they would take away data on purpose when they pretty much admitted that it was magma intrusion. So I don't think it was intentional. But I don't know. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to open this up, spread it out. Let's see. Should we spread this out? No. Let's do that. Nah. Okay. So I'm going to go up here. I'm going to, let's see. What's a good amplitude? Let's do 10,000 as the max and minimum amplitude. Manual scale, persistence rescale off. Window size 1, and since this is a broadband, see how it says BHZ, not EHZ, this is a broadband seismograph. So to make it kind of look like, here, here, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me put on a waveform real quick. Let's do a small earthquake right here. There we go. So let's try to make it look a little more like a short period seismograph. Go to high pass. Press 1. We got 1, then press enable. Boom. Straightens it out a little bit. Look at that. Ain't that interesting. Yeah, you could definitely... De te uh, blah, blah, blah. You could definitely tell Magma had a hand in creating this event. That is for sure. Look at that. Now, where there were a few other events I want to show. The maximum amplitude count is not working out, so I'm just going to go back to auto scale and have that unchecked again. There we go. 5E5. That was a very strong earthquake. Now, let's check this one out. This one looks interesting right here. This looks like a shallow volcanic event. Definitely not tectonic, guys. We definitely had a lot of magma intrusion going on on this day. Look at that. Wow. This had a maximum amplitude count of 40,000. Wow. That's pretty strong. Maximum amplitude count for this looks like about 6,000. This looks like a harmonic tremor. I don't like to use that word very lightly, but it does kind of look like harmonic tremor, guys. Look how wonderful this program is. Look how much you can zoom out. And then look how much you can zoom in. All the way in. And plus, you could even zoom in like that. <laughs> I love it. Now, here's another thing I want to show you right here. <clears throat> here's another good example of why the online seismographs don't show you much. And you cannot tell what something is from just from the online seismographs. You must download data and look at it either in Jama Size or in Swarm or Waves. Now, I'm going to show you this right here. We have a little event right here. That's not what I'm looking at, though. Check this out. Look at that, guys. Let's zoom out. This is one minute's time right here. This is a very low frequency event. Very low frequency. It, it certainly looks like one. So let's do this. Let's go to Spectra. Notice how the majority of the frequencies were in the 1 hertz range. Definitely caused by volcanic activity. And you can tell right here. Notice this? Look at that. 
Magma definitely had a hand in creating this right here as well. Now let's look here. See, there's a drastic difference. Look, this looks more like a tectonic event to me. Oh, this is a hybrid. Ooh, this is a hybrid event. Looks more tectonic and then spreads out at the end. This is magma causing this, guys. And here's another example. To me, this looks more like harmonic tremor. This definitely looks like some type of magma resonance, guys. Imagine clapping a bell. You know, or hitting a bell goes do yo It would create stuff like this. That's kind of like that's kind of how magma works when it's flowing through a tube. It's not really flowing through a tube that well. That's why there are all these other earthquakes here trying to break away the rock and every once in a while we'll see the magma actually flowing like right here and right here as well. This does look like magmatic resonance, guys. And it looks like, yep, here's another one right here as well. And this was on the 29th, I believe. Or the 28th, I mean. The 29th over here, that's the UTC date. And here's another very strong one, guys. Look at this resonance from this. Look at that. Look at that. Let's go to the frequency. Yep, it's down there again. And look at the spectra. One hertz. Harmonic tremor usually occurs between about 0.7 hertz to about 2 hertz. But obviously, it depends on the strength, and it can peak all the way to like 20 hertz. At least that's what I've been told. I don't know if that part is true, but I know harmonic tremor does occur around 0.7 hertz to about 2 hertz. Now again, spectrographs record frequency, time period, and power. That is what the color is right here, is the power, the strength. Now let's zoom out just a little bit. Here's a heads up for the online UNAVCO spectrographs. I want to tell you something. Let's say, since this is a magma intrusion event, this whole event here, I'm not saying this is magma intrusion event itself, this whole event, the multiple days is magma intrusion, one single event. But if you look at this, what appears to be some type of magmatic resonance as seen on the waveforms, possibly harmonic tremor, not saying it is, but possibly harmonic tremor. This is why they were so worried back then. Now notice when I zoom out. Now the UNAVCO spectrographs use a 24 hour period for a small little time frame, right? That spectrograph picture is a 24 hour period. Right here, 6.17.40, 6.18.15. This is less than a minute. A minute compared to 24 hours. Very big difference. Now let's zoom out. Notice how everything starts to disappear because the more and more data you put into it, the same exact window size it will get smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually check this out look when you know, let, let's let's use this for an example see that large earthquake takes up most of the space now let's zoom out where'd it go it's still there you can obviously see it's still there but it disappeared see that's why the unavco spectrographs to me are useless at least to me to other people they could be very very helpful but to me in my specific research they're not very helpful so we have seen multiple examples of magmatic resonance through possibly the tube or fissure or whatever it was creating during this time period. You can see another very low frequency event right here. Let's zoom in a little bit. Yeah, that was very interesting. And here's the last few earthquakes near the end of the swarm. Multiple VT earthquakes. These look like, let's see, let's go to the, yeah, they reach up to 20. Very wide spectra. So there were multiple, multiple different types of earthquakes during the 2008-2009 event. Well, that is a quick overview of the 2008-2009 sequence. Now, let's move on to the April 10th through 11th event that occurred just this year, 2018. Almost a decade later. Alright, this will be a quick overview of the April 10th through 11th, uh, what I believe, intrusion event at Lake Yellowstone. Or Yellowstone Lake, however, which way you like to say it. You can see three sequences within about a day's time. We got one right here, one right here, and one right here. The neighboring seismograph. So this was borehole 208. The neighboring seismograph, YLA, shows three. One, two, three sequences. So... We're going to look at just B208. I just showed YLA just to show you that none of this up here was wind, lightning, cars, or whatever. Just showing you this was a three-sequence seismic event. Let's cut that out. Remember, first thing I do, let's do manuals. Nope, let's do auto scale. Check off, rescale. Let's delete, go one. And we do not have to do a Butterworth filter. Okay. 
just starting off this sequence, these three sequences, I'm going to call this one event. So this one event looks a lot different, a little bit different than the 2008-2009 event, right? Well, the first sequence here looks very weak. Let's see, that's about 1,000. That's uh, amplitude counts 400 there. 5,000 was the amplitude count for this. This looks like a hybrid event right here. Now, when you see a rapid succession of earthquakes, very closely spaced in time, I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, maybe like 30 earthquakes within 30 minutes or something like that, it's better to say that it probably is not tectonic. I mean, I'm not saying it's not impossible. But to me, whenever I've seen rapid succession earthquakes like this, especially like at Kilauea, it's usually related to the movement of magma in some way, shape, or form. Let's zoom in on this right here. Definitely looked like, I, I actually don't know what the cause is of this. Guys, I'm still learning causes of earthquakes. I'm still a beginner at this, guys, so cut me a little slack. <laughs> Let's go to the main sequence right down here. Where did it start? It started right here. Let's take a look at this real quick frequency had a good high frequency so let's go back let's try to find this is the spectra i'm gonna use this to try to find a low frequency event see if i can find the most low frequency out of all of this however it's looking like a lot of these earthquakes during the swarm were vt earthquakes volcano tectonic earthquakes Oh, right here. Aha! Aha! Look what I found. Let's do this. That looks like magmatic resonance. Let's zoom in on the coda. Slightly rhythmic. Goes away quickly, though. Let's look down here at the third sequence. 40,000 count on this one. This was a larger earthquake. I'm going to say maybe 2.0, something like that. You could tell it stretches all the way up to 25. So a lot of these were not low frequency events. But just because something is not low frequency doesn't mean that magma didn't play a hand in creating the event. Look at this straight bar right there. Look at that. That is so weird. Oh, right here to here. Let's see what this is. So it looks like this swarm that occurred April 10th through 11th was mostly a volcano tectonic earthquake, most likely caused by magmatic stresses pushing up the local faults and, you know, doing its thing. Ha, <laughs> that sounded very professional. <laughs> now, let's see, what's next? Now let's check out the waveforms real quick of the very short possible intrusion event on July 5th, 2018. And here's the 40-minute possible intrusion event that occurred on July 5th, 2018 at Little West Thumb in Yellowstone National Park. This is from YLTEHGWY01, this short period vertical station that is the closest to this event in question. Now, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, let me elongate it just a little bit. Notice how I can elongate it like that? Make them shorter like that. Doesn't really matter if they make the seismic signals look smaller or bigger anymore. You could do it yourself. You don't even have to care about microvolts anymore. Isn't that nice? So there's so many things inhibiting us in the beginning, you know, that we're pretty much all free to do what we want now, guys. So let me go to settings. Make sure the uh, auto scale. That's unchecked. That's one. And here we go. Let's check out the waveforms real quick of this event. Just by starting off, you could tell that the waveforms look a little more spread out. Than the April 10th through 11th event. Let's take a look at this right here real quick. You could tell this was a lower frequency event. Notice how it does not spike all the way up into 25 range, the 25 hertz range. Let's go along this area. You could tell a lot of these events could have been hybrid events except this tops out at about 5 hertz. Let's keep going through, keep going through. Here's where it starts to get very interesting. They don't even look like earthquakes anymore, huh? They just look like blobs. Oh, whoops. Ah! Now, these are the parts that concerned me, guys. Let's go back just a little bit. And let's go forward. And this is pretty much the end of the event right here. Notice how a lot of them don't look like the traditional tectonic earthquakes that we usually see. Now let's do a waveform check real quick. 
And let's go through. You can tell a lot of these looked like hybrid events, guys. I want to see. Let's see what the frequency range is for this. Look at that. See the higher the frequency, the lower it goes. Let's see. It spikes around 2, 3, and 4 hertz and then goes down. So that is about a mid-frequency earthquake. I don't even know. Is there such thing as a mid-frequency earthquake? I got to look at that. Or maybe that's what a hybrid event means. So let's go. Let's keep looking. And a lot of these events occurred between 2 and 4 hertz. Now, to me, the two parts that I study the most of this event and the two parts that concerned me the most, let me see if I can find it, was from 555 right here all the way over to about six notice these multiple 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 events that also showed up on the surrounding seismographs as well and they don't look like earthquakes do they no they do not at all Can you tell me those look like earthquakes guys obviously the p and s wave arrivals were all screwed up because they happened in such quick succession but still, at least they should have put on there the number of earthquakes that they guess actually occurred. Because there were multiple events that were not reported. So let's check the frequency. Yeah, mid-frequency. Look at that. That's so odd. But it looks like some tremor of sorts. Just multiple over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then another part that concerned me was 603 UTC. Where is that? 603. Where are you? Where are you? Oh, no, it was this one right here. You can see one, two, three, it seems. Three P waves. At least it seems. But this does not seem tectonic to me at all. It seems like you can see resonance, magmatic resonance right here, right here, and right here as well. Notice how it's at the end of all three, which means those could be actually the earthquake codas from the separate earthquakes that occurred. Well, that was pretty interesting. I'm sorry if the waveform overview wasn't as interesting as you thought it would be. I barely had any time to do this, so... And my kids are going crazy. I don't know if you can hear it or not. My kids are just screaming and yelling. They're not in a good mood. I want to thank the United States Geological Survey, the University of Utah, Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, and IRIS for providing this information and data to the public. Again, some data was missing for the 2008-2009 earthquake swarm, but I doubt that it was intentional since they admitted it was likely a dike intrusion of magma. However, that being said, I do hope the Yellowstone Volcano Observatory decides to do a study into why magma intrusion is occurring at Yellowstone Lake more often than anywhere else within the caldera. It would also be nice to hear their interpretation of this event. Next, I have just a few more interesting things to talk about. But first, there have been seven earthquakes in Australia since July 5th, 2018. A 4.5, a 4.5, a 3.9, a 3.3, a 3.0, 3.2, and a 4.1. All around 10 kilometers to 8 kilometers in depth. I had no clue Australia even got earthquakes. If anyone knows if Australia has any faults or volcanoes, please let me know in the comments section below. I just never used to notice earthquakes here until just about the past few months. But could just be me, once again. <laughs> also, a very strong 6.4 earthquake. I'm going to go all the way down here. 6.4 earthquake struck the northern section of Alaska. It occurred at 1458 UTC at 9.9 .9 kilometers in depth. And multiple, multiple aftershocks, multiple 5.0s. And then something I just noticed coming on here. Boom! Another 6.4, but this time it occurred at 2115, and occurred at 0 0.1 kilometers in depth? Okay, and plus there was also an, uh, an earthquake just a few days ago up here in the Arctic Ocean. Up here, I've been noticing the past few months, very shallow earthquakes, like uh, right at the surface, guys. So what is going on in this area? Is there a new volcano that is possibly about to erupt? I don't know, do they even have volcanoes right on the northern tip right here? Look at that. Big swarm of earthquakes, guys. Look at that. Here we are at Maple Creek at Yellowstone real quick. The 6.4 showed very strong. And the subsequent aftershocks, very strong, guys. Very strong. And boom! Here is the one that we just saw just now. The new 6.4 that occurred. Wow. Very strong, I must say, just for a 6.4. And here we are at Jama Size, and I'm going to show you real quick the first 6.4 that hit Alaska. 
Let's look forward. I spread out the waveforms. This is one minute per line. I did one minute per, per line so you can see the waveforms of this teleseism. Teleseism is a distant earthquake. There's the second earthquake, which was first reported to be a 6.4. I think they just downgraded it. There is the P wave. The start of the P wave. That is how you locate earthquakes. You use the start of the P wave and the start of the S wave and calculate the distance. And real quick, here we are at earth.nullschool.net on the CAM SO2 page. This was for the 11th yesterday. Why is there such a high concentration of sulfur dioxide being emitted just east northeast of Vancouver? Actually, that's more north of Vancouver Island. I know there are a lot of mines up there, but these recent SO2 counts have been absolutely staggering. Right now, the counts for Kilauea are about 100. When it reached its peak, the, the, the sulfur dioxide counts for Kilauea was around 17,000. Normal volcanic activity is anywhere from around 600 to 10,000. It could be higher than that. But usually I do not see this high of sulfur dioxide content up here because there's a lot of mines and they don't really care about the environment too, too much. But the thing is, is look at this, 600. Let me go forward an hour. 715. 763. Let's go forward again. 1,073. Uh, what the hell? 1,043. Let's go forward another hour. 1,260. 668, and this is when it started to calm down. About 11 a.m. Pacific time on the 11th. Why? Let me go back one more time. To the highest concentration, which I believe was right here. Yep, the highest count I can see is 1,260. That is very, 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 very high. Let's check out the carbon dioxide. Wow. Very high amounts of carbon dioxide. Let's check carbon monoxide. Extreme. Just off the chart. 32,000. 32,000. What the hell are they doing here? For example, here are the fires in California. 3,443. These are normal fires that are going on. Release sulfur dioxide when it hits the oils and a bunch of other different gases. But up here, what is going on up here? If anybody knows what is occurring just north of Vancouver Island, putting out just insane amounts of sulfur dioxide, carbon dioxide, and carbon monoxide, please let me know below. Because these counts are absolutely staggering and can actually be fatal if you're exposed to it for long enough in this area. So please let me know below in the comments section. Here is a map of all magnitude 2.4 earthquakes and above that have been reported since today, August 12th, 2018 at 3.46 p.m. Pacific Time to February 1st, 2009. Well, I hope you liked the video, guys. I'm going to start to do quick monthly volcano updates for Yellowstone, Long Valley Caldera, Newberry Caldera, Mount Rainier, Mount St. Helens, Mount Hood, Mount Shasta, and Lassen Peak. It will be a quick overview of earthquake and deformation counts. Any concerning activity, for example, a large swarm breaking out of Yellowstone, will warrant its own video. This is to simply give viewers a simple overview of what happened the previous month. For example, the first monthly update I'm going to do will be uploaded in a few days. This will show the past two months of activity for each volcano since it is the first update. All future updates will be uploaded about five to six days after the month has ended. For example, if I upload a February update, it will most likely be uploaded around March 5th. Please let me know what you think and I thank you all for your support. I love earthquakes and volcanoes and will always push for the truth no matter where it leads. Of that, you do have my promise. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe and look out for my coming videos. Also, don't forget to check out part 1 and part 2 of Amateur Seismology Basics, Misconceptions, and Tools. Go into my channel and click videos and you'll find it in there. I would like to start growing this channel to reach as many people as possible so people know the truth. Heck, the other day I was talking to a neighbor about Hawaii and somehow we got on the topic of how beautiful Yellowstone National Park and Wyoming is compared to Hawaii. To be honest, both have their own beauty. But I asked him if he has ever seen Old Faithful. He said yes, and I asked him if he knew what powers the geysers. Like most people, he said hot water. Of course he is right, but what is the hot water powered by? 
I then told him about Yellowstone, and he was absolutely astonished that such a thing could even exist. That is another reason for what I'm doing. I want to be able to accurately monitor and spread awareness for signs of activity, eventually make a career out of it, and update the public as to the hazards they may face by living near a dormant volcano. By the way, dormant means it's inactive, not extinct. Extinct means the magma chamber is dried up, there's no hope of the magma recharging ever again. Pretty much there's no such thing as an extinct volcano. I wouldn't be surprised if old volcanoes that used to be extinct reawaken. Hell, apparently a lot of people don't even know super volcanoes exist! Sometimes people look at me like I'm a crazy nut when I say they do exist. All the volcanoes I mentioned are high threat volcanoes with an almost certainty that they will erupt again someday. Even most of the people in Bend, Oregon do not know that they live under the shadow of a potentially dangerous, dare I say, supervolcano named Newberry. For some reason, I am more interested in potential supervolcanoes than stratovolcanoes. Nevertheless, I like to keep my guard up. I will always stand for the truth, and I will always follow every lead no matter where it originated. Even if I got a lead from some homeless guy to some Harvard graduate. I will always listen to even the most absurd idea and look into it because, to be honest, we live in a weird world, guys. Impossible things happen all the time. One that we will never truly learn about. That I know for a fact. We will never truly know everything about our planet. Thank you for your time. Please keep an eye out for my next video, which is to be the first volcano report on my channel. I hope to see others rise to the occasion and monitor these hazard areas with me. Be prepared and please always have a plan. Links, parts, and my email address is listed below in the description box. Please contact me, for I love to discuss these things with others who are interested. This is Ben Ferriolo signing off. The truth is hate or fear to those who hate or fear the truth. God bless.